Well, joining us in the studio, we have Dr. Rukewe Ogumba, who is a, a definitely a friend to the network. A big yes. good morning to you. She's also an associate professor in family medicine at the University of, you'll help me here, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, <laughs> Saskatchewan College of Medicine. And Saskatchewan is over in Canada. So you are a family physician and also our resident expert on all things COVID-19. So welcome to the morning show once again. Thanks for me. I mean, uh, no, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rukway, you know, as you're well aware, here we are in the third wave of COVID-19, and that's been propelled forward by the Delta variant. What do you think at this point can be done to protect Nigerians while also mitigating the spread of this new and dangerous uh, variant? Yes, thanks, Remy. It's always nice to be here. And I like to be actually in the studio, so this is nice. <laughs> Um, well, um, you've said it all. Like, um, we know that the COVID um, pandemic is still on. We're very much still in a pandemic. We're getting new strains, and the mutation of the virus has given us the variant. And this um, Delta variant is actually the one that's most concerning. And um, we know that um, the vaccines is the way to go. We know that getting the previous COVID infection doesn't actually protect you from COVID because the variant, it's mutating. But we know that... The aim of vaccination is to make sure that you don't get very sick, end up in the ICU or die. So what are we doing? Um, I'm very happy with, um, you know, well, we're fourth best. OK, depends on who is um, doing the assessment. But um, the fact that we're getting four million doses of Moderna, we're still expecting four million doses of AstraZeneca. And um, we, we, they said there was about three million doses of the Johnson Johnson, but we only have like 180,000 that have come in. It's very encouraging. But you know Nigerians are many. We have 200 million plus people. And most of the vaccines need one or two doses. And um, just the Johnson Johnson's one dose. So we are still way, way below par in terms of what we need to do. We're very lucky in some aspects because our numbers, even though it's rising, it's still quite low compared to what's happening in the rest of the world. Look at what's happening in the United States. The ICU beds are filling up again. So what are we going to do in Nigeria? We know that we do not have the capacity. We do not have the health system that will support very sick people. We don't have the ICU beds, neither the oxygen and all that. So we need to actually prevent transmission. Now, you find that most of the people getting sick now are those people who never took the vaccine. And unfortunately, you can't even blame them because what, we had no vaccine since July. So even if you wanted the vaccine, you couldn't get it until starting, I think, Monday. There's new doses coming on. So what can we do to mitigate the spread? We need to just do the simple things that we did before, ever before the vaccines even arrived, because we had about 10 months of no vaccines. Yeah. Simple hand washing, using face masks. In fact, there's this new study that came out that showed that you're one million times less likely to get the covid if you just use face masks, even just they did a study with face masks in schools. And so we know that your hygiene measures work using the face mask. Well, and even if you're saying you have a medical condition you want to buy, then social distance. It's very, very important. I think that's what we really need to do. And until we get to herd immunity, of course, we know herd immunity is, is lots of vaccines and we really can't afford that because we know the COVID infection doesn't actually protect you from dying from COVID because you can get it again. And of course, there's lots of talk about the immunocompromised. And who are those people? People who have kidney disease, um, who have um, some you know, malignancy, um, they're living with um, very poor um, white cell counts, HIV and things like that. Those people are most likely to die um, from COVID. And there's even a new um, CDC recommendation that those people get three doses of the booster shot. a booster shot. This is just out yesterday. So we know that some people will get the booster shot. Now, we're not saying that this is a booster to get a more reinforced for COVID. We know two doses is enough, but some people will need a third dose. And that's how we're going to stop this virus. The people who are not getting vaccinated are actually the problem. You know why? The virus has nowhere to go if we're all blocking it. But the minute it jumps to someone unvaccinated, it can do a lot of things in the person's body. Again, depends on their immune response. If they're immunocompromised, they will get a more resistant, more infectious, more infected, uh, infect, highly infected. Inf oh my goodness, the words are just <laughs> struggling right. up. Anyway, they get more infectious, and then people get more um, susceptible to getting the, the virus, and then the spread is faster. And of course, the elderly people are with waning immune systems are, are actually very, very 
um, vulnerable to such. And of course, the young people are the ones that are probably now the most vulnerable group because we know that they don't really obey rules. And um, of course, we even seen younger ages and the recommended ages of 12 to 18. Um, I know Nigeria is only vaccinating 18 and above, but we know that 12 to 18 can receive the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer, the mRNA um, vaccines. And we know that the virus is jumping to the younger age groups as it's mutating. So yes, please get a vaccine. And when you don't get the vaccine, please social distance, use a face mask, use, use the simple hand washing. The virus is very fragile, actually. So if you do what you need to do, you should be fine. Okay, Dr. Gumba, I mean, um, let me expand the argument a bit, especially uh, given that you, you've tried to break down um, how the vaccines work and those who, are, who might be the problem. I, I'm not so sure. I'm wondering if at this point in Nigeria, uh, even in, you know, almost everywhere in Africa, if we can begin to talk of uh, the unvaccinated being the problem. Because Nigeria, for example, barely 1.5% have been fully vaccinated. Uh, Less than 2 million have taken the second, you know, uh, 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 dose. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's really minute. We can't really... Just 1% uh, of the population. Exactly. So if you, anywhere where you are, maybe just one or two persons with you, that will have been vaccinated. So it comes back to what you have explained. Uh, what kept us um, out of trouble for 10 months should be what we need to return to, you know, your face mask and your... Uh, uh, Social, social distancing, distancing and everything. Hand washing. Absolutely. However, um, what sort of education do you think Nigerians will need now that the uh, second phase of the vaccine rollout will start uh, on Monday? Uh, you mentioned the fact that Johnson & Johnson is coming, and we know that for a fact, uh, more AstraZeneca and, of course, Moderna. I know of a few people who say to me that, you know, I've taken AstraZeneca, but then I hear that it cannot go to European unions and that it came from India, I'm also going to take Johnson & Johnson. Some other people say, if I take only with Johnson & Johnson, it's just a single dose. Uh, most of the people talking about vaccine um, passport, vaccine health passport, are saying that you need two doses. Why do you think Nigerian government will bring in Johnson & Johnson, given the fact that it's just a single dose, and those who are going to get it will not have the advantage of taking a second dose, except you crossover to uh, AstraZeneca or to Moderna. Is that allowed? What sort of education do we need to send out to our people now that we have about three different types of vaccines coming? It's very interesting and very important question. In fact, I was just at a meeting at the College of Saskatchewan um, Physicians where we're trying to determine what the, the idea will be in terms of vaccine mixing. You know that in Canada, we actually stopped giving the AstraZeneca because of the VIN, which is um, the vascular complication from AstraZeneca. It was a very small percentage of people that got blood clots and then they died, mm. some people. And so we after decided... Taking the vaccine. After taking the vaccine. It was a very rare um, thing, but it was, you know, it, it hasn't been seen much, but we had a lot of options for vaccines. So they decided to pull that back. And a lot of people were concerned that they're taking the first dose of AstraZeneca, what to do next? Since uh, <laughs> since we're saying don't take the second dose of um, I understand half of Nigeria didn't even go for the second dose. Yes, after <laughs> they had that bit. So what is it? Um, to be honest, AstraZeneca is safe and you could have gotten your second dose. And the two dose vaccine is probably better than the first dose. We know that Johnson & Johnson has even showed waning immunity over time. Um, with the Delta variant. So we know that, um, again, they'll have to bring out their numbers and research and people that back in Johnson & Johnson will probably argue with me, but I believe that <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about even the third dose right now, the same vaccine. I don't, I don't know um, what the research would say, but I would, I would recommend that get a vaccine, okay? okay. A vaccine is better than water. Okay. Um, for now, to get that passport, especially the... Um, vaccine passport to travel to other countries, they require two doses of the same vaccine. Interesting. And so... Um, Johnson & Johnson would take you out well, of that. They haven't recommended that. <laughs> okay. But the truth is, mixing the vaccines is safe, okay? It's actually very safe. You can take Pfizer and take Moderna. You can take AstraZeneca and take uh, Pfizer. You can take two different vaccines. The studies are out there, so I'm not just postulating. 
whether it's going to give you a better immunity is going to is left to be seen. Whether it's going to be acceptable later down the line for countries that you want to go into. Right now, the countries are saying two doses of the same vaccine with the time interval apart, and you are you must have had the vaccine um, at least four weeks prior to the second dose prior to going there. So you'll have had four weeks to build your immune system. And so we're saying get the same vaccine. However, mixing vaccines is safe. I know the um, rollout. Um, um, the people in charge, I forget what they call them, have said, um, don't take a different vaccine. Um, to be honest, if you have an opportunity to take a second dose of any vaccine, do take it. That will be my recommendation. I know there's shortages of vaccines, so I'm not sure if there's politics behind telling people that only take the second dose of the same vaccine. But for the purpose of getting that passport, it's probably um, the two doses of the same one. Um, we know that the COVID is probably going to be around for a while. Um, it's not going to be, you know, just be like the, um, the Ebola or the SARS, or the SARS um, virus, SARS one. When, when SARS one and um, H1N one that died out very quickly. This is a very different type of um, virus. It's very aggressive and it's mutating. It's looking for how to stay here, and that's the problem. Not getting the vaccine. So yes, get your vaccination. Try to get the same one. Try to jump in front of the queue. I know there are two types of people, the people that will travel abroad just to even get the vaccine and the people that are here that you pretty much have to drag them to get the vaccine. We don't want um, we don't want that. We want everyone to be pretty much aware that the pandemic is a real threat. It has not done the damage, it, it, you know, to Nigerians yet because we have a lot of protective measures that are really helping us. But don't be fooled. It's here. People have died, healthy people have died, young people have died, and um, it's not, there's no uh, myth about it. It's not a um, pandemic, as some people say. Mm -hmm. People are trying to use um, this to, to get economic advantage. I don't know how the virus started. That's a different <laughs> kind of theory, but um, it's here and it's dangerous. I mean, let's talk about vaccine equality. For a long time, you know, since the adoption of these vaccines, it does seem as though African countries and indeed the developing world have been left behind in terms of the development of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And if, with, if the World Health Organization, G7 and all of these other groups say that they want 70% uh, of the world's population to be vaccinated by this time next year, surely the developing world aren't going to be able to meet their own targets if they're, hand, if they're relying on handouts, whether it's from COVAX, whether it's purchasing vaccines. Do you think that Big Pharma should be sharing their patents with other countries so that the greater good of people being vaccinated as soon as possible can actually be realised? Or do you think that this is a situation where money matters over people? Huh. This is politics. You asked me a very big political question. The truth is, all lives matter, whether you're in a poor or rich country. And um, we know that it's not equal. And just like your fingers, it's not equal at all. And while we have excess um, doses in, in Canada, we, we have, people are looking for how to get vaccinated here. So yes, they need to share. They need to share. I know that um, um, China had shared their um, vaccines with some Middle Eastern countries and some um, Asian countries, and they were repackaging them. And they can do that with us. Um, we have the abilities. NAFDAQ is very capable. Like you said, I was in the Committee of Health as a consultant. And we know how much was appropriated for some labs for NAFDAQ billions. And so I know they have the capacity. Um, the training, um, they need to create a budget for. But I think very much that there's a lot of suspicion um, about the economics behind pushing vaccines. Um, vaccines have always been suspicious. We know that... Um, it's very interesting how um, in 12 weeks, 12 months, we're able to get a vaccine, whereas it takes about 12 years to develop a vaccine for most infectious diseases. So there's a lot of suspicion about the economics of that. These vaccines are not cheap. They're pretty expensive, especially how you store them, how you transport them and all those things. And so someone is making money somewhere. And so in the end, you, you know that um, developed worlds have put a lot of money into big pharma. And so they, they will have to recoup their money somehow. And we know they're donating to us. But bottom line is, we're all humans. We all have the same um, DNA. We all share the same hopes and dreams. And we all have the right to the same quality of health care. Now, in Nigeria, I'm not, um, 
I don't want to criticize the government, but right now the resident doctors are, are on strike yeah. for for <laughs> for things that they had promised them and a while ago. And I don't know how they think it's not important that doctors should be working now because some people may not even know that they have COVID and there are many, many other infectious diseases that will be picked up even for the first time by doctors because they observe someone. Now, these people are not being attended to. What's going to happen? We're going to get more sick people and more deaths. And so, I, again, I don't want to get too political, but our government needs to sit up. Sit up in our healthcare. Our leaders are going elsewhere to get treatments. I think it's really unacceptable. Uh, most of us in the diaspora, we are doctors, we are professors in medicine. I would say we are the best of the best, and we have the same knowledge because we are Nigerians. We can apply it in Nigeria. So we just need to just sit up and get serious about our health care. There's no excuse, really, why Nigeria with 200 plus million people and the kind of resources that we have are really begging for anything. I'll stop here. I mean, you're right. I mean, you said it's a political thing, but of course there's no way we can um, take our eyes off it, uh, given the fact that even the president of the country has just returned from abroad, yes, to attend the summit, but of course to also see uh, his doctors. Medical tourism. I, I mean, there, there, there have been loads of justification as to why he has to continue with the same doctors. But then, I mean, in, in a country where you can trust your own hospitals or your own doctors, and the doctors are going on strike, uh, I'm not so sure how that will sink in well with a lot of Nigerians. But I would like you to uh, shed more light on the sort of education uh, that uh, the vaccinated people, uh, uh, no matter how little they might be for now, uh, she would deal with the sort of news that came out last week uh, about a professor at the University of Ibadan who had been uh, double vaccinated but still passed on, caught the virus, you know, and passed on. I wouldn't want to mention his name because the oh, family... Oh, we all know him. It's a virologist. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, and, yes. and, and he's still passed on. And, and mm. a lot of people were worried about, you know, um, if you are to get a vaccine, not only can you still contract it and possibly pass it on, the possibility of death, we don't know what the underlying effects are. Should people be worried or vaccine is just an additional um, protocol to the other things that we have been dealing with in terms of, you know, um, wearing masks, uh, um, social distancing and everything? Why, why can't a vaccine, as we've always done a vaccine to be, you know, give complete protection? There's no such a thing in this world as complete protection in medicine. Even if I give you treatment for malaria, I'll tell you maybe 99% cure that a thermometer is gonna work for you as opposed to chloroquine. So we can never, doctors, no doctor will tell you this is foolproof. No vaccine has ever been told to be foolproof. When we take the animal flu jabs, we know that you may still get the flu, just that you won't end up in hospital and you won't have sick days off work. You just have a new sliffle because you had some immunity to fight the virus. It's just like a really silly joke. The guy said, oh, I got a job. He <laughs> wasted my time anyways. I was never ever sick. Well, that's the point. The <laughs> job made sure you were not sick. So this is it. Unfortunately, the professor died. Okay. And um, there are many, many reasons why a vaccine failed him. Okay. okay. I don't know his um, medical history, immunocompromised um, situation, whether he has some other issues he was dealing with. I don't know um, when he took the vaccine, if he had already contracted the COVID first before he started vaccinating himself. There are many, many issues why after being vaccinated you die. We never said it's 100%, but it's, it's most likely to block it. So again, um, I would say your vaccine is really actually the best bet. We said it's 95%, the best one is about 95% protecting you from serious illness and death. And if someone dies because of um, even having showed his passport um, of two doses, does not mean that the vaccine is the, the, the fault of that um, cause of the death. OK, so he may, like I said, have many other things that, again, you have to know his intimate um, details of his uh, medical history before you can conclude that this vaccine was the issue. What, what vaccine did he have? And we know that there's a waning immunity to vaccines in uh -huh. immunocompromised people. So those people need a third vaccine that actually come out. So maybe someone like him might, will have needed a third dose. We know that getting the vaccines does not mean you won't get the infection. It just means you're less likely to get sick and die from it and less able to spread it. 
and the vac and the virus when it jumps into you the vaccinated has no chance to mutate so you're blocking it so it's not going to get to um, zeta or gamma or whatever variant we're in delta now because you have blocked it so it doesn't have the chance to do all the jig in your body so vaccinations is really important and i'm sorry for the loss it was a great man and um to talk to you the other people that have been vaccinated if you're vaccinated, you're not, um, you're not God. You still need to do your social distancing, you still need to wear masks, especially in crowded places. Do not assume that because you're fully vaccinated, you're, you're totally um, impregnable. No, you need to still be cautious, be cautious until we say the pandemic is over. We're right in the middle of the pandemic and the virus is looking for ways to stay. Let's take a, a little side step away from COVID-19 just for a second. <laughs> and uh, Enough of that if already. we can, <laughs> if it's even possible. What can you tell us about the, di the discovery of the Ebola-like Marburg virus? Marburg, yeah. um, I know that back in 2014 was also a very difficult year for Nigeria in terms of Ebola. But what do you think Nigeria can do with the experience they had with that Ebola outbreak to protect itself against the incoming threat of a virus like Marburg? Yes, it's very interesting. They're very similar viruses. It used to be called uh, Marburg hemorrhagic disease, like Ebola, but they changed the name to MVD, Marburg virus disease. And it's never been in um, West Africa. It, this is the first time it jumped from the east and south to the west. So this is, it, is not a Guinea. Or where, where? It was in Guinea. Okay. It's in Guinea right now, which is in the west of Africa. It used to be in um, faraway places like um, Burkina Faso, um, South Africa, you know. Anyways, the Marburg virus is a very um, similar virus to Ebola. It's transmitted from the fruit bat. And um, when it gets to humans, it jumps from humans to humans. And um, I'm very proud of what Nigeria did in 2014. Um, the virus stayed only like five months and only 19 cases. And they traced thousands of people. And so that was the main way we stopped it. We identified the index case. Very quickly, we did contact tracing. We isolated those people that were exposed and it couldn't pass anywhere because you stopped it moving. So once you isolate someone who is infected with the virus, it doesn't have anywhere to jump. It stops there. This is what we the same similar situation with COVID. So if it, if it jumps to me and um, I'm not aware that I have the virus, I just keep mixing, I keep putting it out there. So once they found it, because it's such a nasty Hemorrhage, I mean, you'll be bleeding from anywhere. It causes DIC's death. It's very, very bad. So it's very frightening. So people don't want that. And of course, we did um, get in fumigation, getting rid of the rats in the home and all those things. You know, they did some stringent measures. And of course, you couldn't cross the border without getting temperature checks. And in fact, Nigeria was leading in that one again. And the whole world had to cut for us. And I want them to clap for us for more things. But yes, we can learn lessons from there. We did contact tracing. I know there was a center that was set up that, um, I think they called it the FETP, which is the um, Nigerian Field Epidemiology Project. Okay. They took lead from there and the subgroup of the CDC. And so that group was very, very acutely involved in this. And they did very vigorous contact tracing. There was no cure for Ebola, as you know. There's no cure for Marburg. It's just supportive treatment, um, hydrate them, treat their fever and all that. So we don't have a vaccine for that. So we really can't afford to have this. And so we're hoping it stops in Guinea. We're hoping they do their contact tracing. We hope there's funding for the epidemiologists to do their work. So that's right. it. So yeah. Okay. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Gamba. I mean, it's been uh, very enlightening, you know, sharing perspective. Uh, uh, with us. I mean, let's hope, of course, that uh, things will change and people will uh, adhere strictly, you know, to all the protocols, whether it's for uh, COVID or, you know, being prepared as for the Marburg thing. Thank you for joining us. Always okay. a pleasure. All Have right. a great day. Thank you. Nice it's to meet you in person. Thank you. <laughs>